Um, and today we are here to learn about methane hydrates. Uh, this session on methane hydrates is part of our public education series on frontier energy, which aims to explore innovations on the edge of mainstream adoption, focusing on technological opportunities and the role of public and private sectors in the innovation process. The methane hydrate is, uh, is molecules of natural gas trapped in an ice-like cage of water molecules. If methane hydra is either warmed or depressurized, it will revert back to water and natural gas. It's from all the DOE and JAGMIC websites, and that's how much I know on the more of the chemistry side. Anyway, uh, that's why I'm here to, uh, to be educated. While global resource estimates vary considerably, the energy content of methane hydrates, uh, a methane occurring hydrate form, is immense. Uh, possibly ex exceeding the combined energy content of all other known fossil fuels. Also, future production volumes are speculative uh, at this point because uh, methane production from hydro is only at the experimental stage today. But its successful large-scale production can mean a game changer for many country or countries with substantial methane hydrate resources and beyond to the uh, global energy system potentially. Uh, we have the two leading methane hydrate technology experts today to help us better understand what methane hydrate is, its resource potential, where we are in global, uh, in terms of global R&D efforts, uh, particularly you know, with a particular focus uh, on uh, the U.S. and J Japanese efforts, and what uh, maybe you know we can also talk about some of the environmental implications uh, that the methane hydrate production may have. Uh, right uh, to my Right, uh, you know, uh, from you uh, to my left is Ray Boswell. He's the technology manager for methane hydrates with the National Energy Technology Lab. And uh, to his right uh, is Takami Kawamoto. He's the deputy director general of the Methane Hydrate Research and Development Group with the Japan Oil, Gas, and Metals National Corporation, uh, Corporation uh, also known as JAGMIC, uh, based in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, so, without further ado, and I, I believe that the, your, uh, the handout has uh, more of an extensive uh, narrative, impressive bios on uh, the two gentlemen. So, I invite you to look at them for further information. But uh, without further ado, uh, Ray, please um, uh, help educate us. Thank you very much, Jane. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about uh, gas hydrates. It's a fascinating subject. It's one that didn't exist in anybody's mind when I was in school which was only a couple decades ago. Uh, <clears throat> and now it's getting a lot of attention. Um, in the last decade, nations have launched very sincere, comprehensive scientific expedi expeditions to appraise gas hydrate resource potential. And each one of these expeditions has returned positive results such that each country is continuing to invest and study this issue. So it's accelerating rapidly. So Jane mentioned this a little bit, but I'll just go a little over what gas hydrate is. It's a naturally occurring solid substance that will form spontaneously whenever you put a gas molecule of the appropriate size in the presence of water under certain specific pressure and temperature conditions. Water is ubiquitous, and in nature, methane turns out to be fairly ubiquitous as well. So. A hundred years ago, people thought you could only make hydrates in the lab. It was only in the late 60s that people began to realize that the conditions that would create hydrate would occur in nature. And it wasn't until the 80s that anybody actually saw one. So it's a relatively new science. Um, but now that we've gotten our hand, hand around it, uh, it's beginning to change the way we think about a lot of things that involve carbon, organic carbon carbon cycle, energy, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> people ask about the gas. It is the same methane gas that is in natural gas. Um, in most gas hydrates, the gas is predominantly methane. A lot of times it's 99% methane. That methane is generated by microbial processes or thermogenic processes. The hydrate doesn't care. Okay. <clears throat> um, where can hydrate occur? Where do you get these unique conditions whereby you're putting something under a lot of pressure, but you're also not heating it up because pressure and temperature in nature generally tend to increase together? It happens whenever you have some thick overburden that's cold, either permafrost or deep water. 
And depending on where you are in the globe, it's 300 to 500 meters of water is enough to depress the thermal gradient enough so that grass hydrate can form. So you can see these charts. They're fairly complex charts. The red chart is the gas hydrate stability boundary. Uh, to your left of those, a uh, gas hydrate is stable. <clears throat> the blue line is the typical pressure change with depth, and hydrate occurs in these conditions. So in about 800 feet of water, you might get 200 foot thick stability zone. Deeper water, the stability zone gets thicker yet. All right, but that's where gas hydrate can occur. That's not where it necessarily does occur. So people have attempted to create models to understand where is the organic matter, where, what is the temperature and pressure like in different places to generate the methane that would create hydrate and make these global models to try to estimate how much hydrate exists. And a variety of approaches, it's a big area. If you assume 0.5% of the available space is, high, is filled with hydrate, you'll get a very different answer than someone who believes that 2% is filled with hydrate. Even though both numbers are still very low, they'll be different by a factor of four. And that's what we're getting. The numbers that come out of the models have one thing in common, they have a lot of zeros. <clears throat> uh, but these numbers, we talk about them in trillions of cubic feet, so the low Order estimates are 100,000 trillion cubic feet of methane in place in hydrate form on the globe. The larger number is up to 4 million. I think a lot of people would put the number somewhere, of course, in between those. <clears throat> if you take some number that's in between, though, hydrate represents a substantial portion of all the potentially mobile organic carbon on the planet. And this is something that wasn't known 20 years ago. And so this has a lot of implications, right? And the major implications of hydrates are for the safety of operations offshore where you're trying to get at something and you have to go through <clears throat> a zone of gas hydrate to get to it. Uh, the implications for the global environment, what does it mean for long-term carbon cycling, short-term responses of the geosphere to climate change, the development of particular chemosynthetic biological communities that feed on methane, um, the stability of the continental shelves. But what we're here to talk about primarily is what it means for the energy resource, what its implications are for energy resources in the future. <clears throat> okay. So to take that big number with all the zeros and put it into a context of, of what might actually be a feasible reality for gas hydrate as an energy source, I think one of the first things to appreciate is that not all gas hydrates are the same. They vary dramatically in their form and their concentration. And the primary thing that differentiates these forms is the host sediment in which the hydrate accumulates. So we see up here on, on the images, you can see in the upper right, there's hydrate in mud. Hydrate in mud tends to be concentrated at very low saturations, but over large areas. <clears throat> On the bottom right, there's a seafloor mound. This is where methane has escaped to the seafloor and formed a solid mass of hydrate. These things can be the size of cars to houses littered around the seafloor. But the interesting ones for gas hydrate energy are the ones where hydrate forms within the pore space of a coarse grain sediment, a sand or a coarse silt. <clears throat> These sand-hosted hydrates have resource, have methane that's concentrated to a high degree. 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of the pore space can be filled with hydrate. Uh, this is because they're in a host media that is amenable to letting the gas in the water mix and assemble the hydrate. Uh, that is also, that, that same quality is what also makes them most amenable to the proven production concepts. So the most promising one, which Kamoto san will talk about in a, in a minute, I believe, is the depressurization technique. And if you have a reservoir that is porous and permeable, you have the ability to transmit pressure through it a lot more easily than through something that is quite tight. <clears throat> so these sand-hosted hydrates are the initial resource target. So first question then is how do you go about finding them? And the basic 
answer to that question is by using the same approaches that have guided conventional exploration for hydrocarbons for the last century. <clears throat> With one thing, you have to tailor it for gas hydrates by making sure you're in the gas hydrate stability zone. Right? So in this diagram, geophysicists have determined where the approximate base of the gas hydrate stability zone is. And they're looking in, if you're look, looking for hydrates, you're looking in the area between that and the seafloor for things that have geophysical indications of gas hydrate. So that's what we call direct detection. That's when you see the hydrate directly because of how it has changed the physical properties of the sediment that it's in. This will be a risky proposition, as all geologic exploration is. And you have to, you can mitigate the risks or the uncertainties by also looking to see that you have a supply of gas. There's an evidence up here. And you have migration pathways that connect the supply of gas to the reservoirs that you're lo looking at. And that's the way exploration is done for conventional oil and gas as well. All right, so there's no black box. There's nothing uniquely different about hydrate from an exploration concept. So I'm going to give you a few examples of gas hydrate exploration from the major sites around the world that you're going to hear more about. <clears throat> First one is Nankai Trough, Japan. I really can't do this without standing and pointing. Is that OK? Yep. Um, can everyone hear him? Well, actually, we might. Well, maybe I can do it without um, standing up on this way. Um, would you like to just move down this? No, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. okay. Um, what do you use this? Online. <laughs> 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 um, I'll break the screen. But. Okay. You can't break it. Don't worry. So about geophysics it. can be kind of complicated, but also can, it can be really pretty simple. This is, on reflection seismic, typical response you get from the seafloor. And that just means you've gone from something that transmits sound waves quite readily to something I mean, quite slowly to something that transmits them quite more readily, or something that we call slow to something fast or hard. You're going from the water to the sediment, and you get this big reflection. Whenever you hit something hard, you get a reflection that looks like that, and hydrate makes the sediment somewhat hard, and it's kind of anomalous amongst the things that can exist in that part of the sediment column that do that. So whenever you see something that looks kind of like the seafloor, below the seafloor, it's potentially a gas hydrate. And in this example, you can see all these reflections here that look just like the seafloor. So that is combined with the standard geophysical analysis of where do I think reservoir quality rocks are with the pressure temperature regime of where do I think the stability zone is, and you've got a hydrate prospect. And this is a big, thick sand that's impinging into the base of the gas hydrate stability zone. And these have been drilled 20, 30, 40 times offshore in Japan and yeah. found hydrate pretty much every time, right? <clears throat> okay, uh, another example from the Gulf of Mexico. Here we've got maps made by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management of various geophysical indicators of gas hydrate. All of them could be a gas hydrate, could not be gas hydrate. They need to be tested. Uh, an industry consortium with DOE went to three of these sites. I'm going to show you an example from one. Uh, drilled seven wells, we found hydrate in sand reservoirs in four of the seven wells. <clears throat> Whoops. And here is an example of one of these things that's slow, changing to hard as you move into the gas hydrate stability zone. So this is a thin layer of reservoir quality sand that's inclined and in going into the gas hydrate stability zone. And its nature is changing right there because above, the sand is filled with hydrate, and below, it's filled with gas. Uh, if you make a map on this plane, it looks like this, where you can see the sand body full of gas below and full of hydrate above. This was drilled and confirmed to be gas hydrate. Oh, that's the wrong down button. Okay. The third example, uh, the North Slope of Alaska. Hydrates also exist underneath permafrost. Modeling over several, many years by the USGS identified where the hydrate stability zones existed and where hydrate was likely to occur. Detailed geophysical investigations delineated specific prospects. And in 2007, we went in and drilled one of those. And there was hydrate there. And this was the hydrate. We found 100 feet of hydrate in sand there. So 
the basic ish message here is that thus far, it seems that there is a fairly viable way of delineating gas hydrate from standard data <coughs> and finding it. So how much is there? That's kind of the big question. Based on some of this work in Alaska and elsewhere, USGS has assessed 85 TCF of technically recoverable resources on the Alaska North Slope. That is gas hydrate that they believe is recoverable with the technology that exists today. Uh, it doesn't mean it's economic today. <coughs> In the Gulf of Mexico, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has assessed 21,000 TCF in place total, 6,000 of that in place in the types of sand reservoirs and at the high concentrations that make them resource targets. That's 6,700 TCF uh, compared with our annual consumption of 20 or 30 TCF. <clears throat> Are these TCF of hydrate or of methane? TCF of methane at surface conditions. Okay. Uh, they've recently conducted an investigation on the Atlantic margin where they have large areas that they believe are prone to sand in the gas hydrostability zone and potentially even larger volumes existing there. Okay. <clears throat> There's been one attempt to try to estimate how much gas in place exists in sand-rich reservoirs globally, and that was done by Arthur Johnson of Hydrate Energy International a few years ago. And he came up with a cumulative total number of around 43,000 TCF. Right. And it's distributed fairly equitably around the globe. So this is his effort to try to determine where in that stability zone are you likely to have the reservoirs that allow hydrate to accumulate to the concentrations that make it a feasible exploration and production target? So I got two slides left. And one of the important things here is when you're talking to someone about hydrates, make sure you know what they mean when they use the word resource. Some people will talk about the hydrate resource and be talking about the in-place number, which is 100,000, 4 million, trillion. It's, it's a number that's really not relevant to the what is the energy potential of hydrate discussion. What we need to talk about is what is the technically recoverable fraction. And we've begun to move away from those astronomical numbers and zero in on that by zeroing in on that portion of the hydrate resource that is in sand reservoirs. And that's been done in just a few places on the globe where it's been enough data to support it. And those numbers suggest that the recoverable resource is going to be somewhere likely in the tens of thousands, potentially. But that's technically recoverable. That is not necessarily economically recoverable. And whether it's economically recoverable or not depends on just what technologies are used to produce it. Uh, so sum up this first part. Uh, the gas hydrate in place resources are large but poorly constrained and not entirely relevant to this particular question. Uh, the occurrences are widespread and variable. Um, Sand-hosted sand hydrates are the ones that are the most relevant to the resource question, and they have been found both offshore and in Arctic settings. We're going to estimate the resource on the order of 10,000 TCF now, acknowledging that only a few areas have been studied in detail. And we know that we have existing exploration methods that will seem to give us positive results. So I think with that, I am... Done? Great. Thank you, sir, for this. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Ray. And, uh, and Mr. Kawamoto, your turn. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as Jane Kandri int introduced me, my name is Takami Kawamoto. I'm working for Jogmec. And uh, as you may know that uh, Jogmec has been promoting Japan's methane hydrate research and uh, development program. We have con conducted the first offshore project test in March last year based on this program. Today, I'll briefly talk about the update of the methane hydrate R&D activities in Japan. It's a kind of 
Ray sort of introduced uh, quite a uh, pure scientific thing, but I can kind of introduce a sort of a more development side of the uh, methyl hydrate things. <laughs> this one? I skip a couple of them. This is already explained by uh, Ray. <coughs> yep. <coughs> Uh, in this slide, I'd like to explain the Japan's methane hydrate research and development program itself, which was announced by MITI in 2001. This program is comprised of three phases. Phase one started in 2001 and finished in 2008. In this phase, onshore production tests were conducted twice at a permafrost area in Canada. Regarding inside of Japan, we conducted studies relating to resource assessment in Eastern Nankai Trough. I will uh, talk about these uh, activities in phase one later on. In phase two, phase two started in 2009 and is supposed to finish by 2015. We are in this phase right now. We have conducted the first offshore production test at Eastern Nankai Trough. In this phase, we are exploring the opportunity to conduct onshore production test as well. The last, phase, last part is phase three. Phase three is scheduled to start from 2016. This phase is planned to establish the te technological platform for the future commercial production. We have just started the preparation for the next offshore production test in phase three. And from now on, I'd like to touch upon our activities in phase one of the program for a while. In 2002, we conducted the first onshore production test at Malik site at Mackenzie Delta, which is a permafrost area in Northwest Territories in Canada. We conducted the production test by applying a heated water circulated method. As Ray explained that uh, when you want to dissolve that uh, methane hydrate, either you should uh, raise the temperature or reduce the pressure. So this time we just raise the temperature at the site. We successfully produced the methane gas through dissociation of methane hydrate, although production volume was not so big. We, however, revealed that heat water circulation method does not have enough energy efficiency through this test. In 2007 and 2008, we conducted the second onshore production test at same site at Malik in Canada again. We applied a depressurization method in this time and produced 13,000 cubic meter of methane gas in six days. We could verify the effectiveness of the depressurization method through the second test. That is why we decided to use this method in the first offshore production test in Japan. While <coughs> we conducted the onshore production test in Canada, we are also conducting a resource assessment of methane hydrate inside Japan. We picked up the Eastern Nankai Trough as a model area for our research. This is a map for Eastern Nankai Trough. After the program started, two-dimensional seismic surveys and 3D seismic surveys are conducted. Based on the interpretation of the seismic surveys, we conducted the campaigns of drillings and the quarrings in 2004 named Tokaioki Kumanonada Exploratory Drillings. This figure shows a 2D high-resolution seismic lines by pink, pink line, and also the brown lines. And the areas of 3D, 3D seismic surveys by yellow rectangles. And uh, we drilled 16 points of the exploratory drilling in 2004. That's shown by the red circle. And this is a result of our resource assessment in Eastern Nankai Trough. It's kind of, well, detailed, but uh, I explained. We introduced the concept of methane hydrate concentrated zone, where methane hydrate is concentrated in sandy layers as a similar manner to the conventional natural gas fields. We confirmed more than 10 methane hydrate concentrated zone at the Eastern Nankai Trough. Pink part in this table shows the evaluated resource amount of methane hydrate concentrated zone, or MHCZ, 
yellow line shows the resource amount of MECGs, which were confirmed by exploratory drillings. And the green line shows the resource amount of methane MHCG, which are evaluated by seismic surveys and which are not confirmed by drilling. <coughs> the addition of these two lines will give you total resource amount of MCC, MHCG, which is equivalent to approximately 20 TCF of methane gas in place as a mean value. Light blue part shows the resource amount of methane hydrate bearing layers other than methane hydrate concentration zone. The resource amount other than the concentration zone was evaluated by a calculation, applying data acquired where we did not identify MHCZ by drillings. In total, we estimated resource amount in place is equivalent to approximately 40 TCF of methane gas in place as a mean value in the Eastern Nankai Turf as a whole. At the end of phase one, we devised a map of methane hydrate distribution in Japan. There are differences in color depending on the prob probabilities of uh, methane hydrate distribution. Red color represents an area where concentrated zones are confirmed, which is Eastern Nankai Trough, as you see. <coughs> Blue represents an uh, area where concentrations are suggested. Green represents an area where concentrations are not suggested. Light blue represents an area where we only have limited data to identify the concentration. We estimate these probabilities of methane hydrate distributions mainly utilizing BS, BSR occurrence. They did not explain uh, BSR much, but the BSR stands for bottom simulating reflector which appears parallel to the uh, sea floor when the methane hydrate exists. I'll explain that later. And the total BSR area is 122,000 square kilometers in Japan. We could identify BSR occurrence by utilizing data from past seismic surveys. Uh, from here, I would like to talk about the first offshore production test conducted in phase two. We selected one of the concentrated zones identified in phase one as a target of the test, this uh, red circle. Yellow area shows the BSR distributions and uh, the site was selected among more than 10 concentrated zones based on the overall evaluation by comparing various aspects. This is 50 to 70 kilometers off the coast of main island of Japan. And this shows a seismic profile of the test location. It may be difficult to see the light blue lines. Well, this is BSR, bottom simulating reflector. This is parallel to the uh, Oka, parallel to the, this uh, sea floor because that uh, condition of the temperature and the pressure is the same at the level, so that this shows this. And uh, this lies top of the gas hydrate concentrated zone, so we have a well, concentrated, uh, sorry, methane hydrate concentrated zone here. So we targeted this uh, area for the production. <coughs> and uh, this, this is a horizontal view of the total yeah, target area. This is a well, origin from the sort of a, well, uh, the, how do you say? Uh, the, it's made by the uh, sort of a current. I, how do you say? I, I forget. <laughs> Sorry. And this is vertically exa exaggerated uh, well, figure, so that real scale is like that, quite uh, shallow. Yeah formation. And this is slide show the layout of the wells for the first production test in, on the, uh, the right side. We drilled four wells, including one production well, P well, two monitoring wells, MC well, and the MT1 well, and one coring well, C well. 
We drilled the two monitoring wells adjacent to the uh, production well in around 20 meter distance, very near. Figure on the right hand side show the layout of the drilled wells. Picture on the left, left hand side shows the images, image drawings of the floor test conducted the Daini Atsumig Nol in the eastern Nankai Trough. The sea depth is approximately 1,000 meters, and depths of the mesonhydrate bearing layers are at around 300 meters from the, from the sea floor. And regarding the P-well, we use the drill ship and riser pipe for drilling and the floor test. After drilling and the completion by Global Pack, we run borehole assembly, specially designed and manufactured for the floor test. We decide to apply depressurization method to this floor test. We pump out the water inside riser pipe so that we are able to reduce the pressure at the borehole. We have drilled these two monitoring wells in order to monitor the changes in temperature in 20 meter distance, aiming to capture the dissociation of mesonhydrate layers there. If the, since that uh, mesonhydrate is, when that uh, dissociate, that uh, reduces the temperature. So we have successfully monitored the temperature drops at the, these wells. And now I would like to show the result of the floor test. We started operations on January 28th and ended them on April 1st. In the early morning of March 12th, we finished running borehole assembly and installed packer. We began floor test at 5.40 a.m. with decreasing the pressure of bottom hole by ESP pump. We confirmed the gas production from mesonhydrate layers at 9.30 at around 10 o'clock we ignited the flaring. We continued production after flaring by March 18th, when we had an unexpected sand production on board. We decided to end the flow test because of the sand production and the water status, sorry, the weather status where we had expected a very bad in the night of the day, which might make us to disconnect the drill ship from the P-well. The graph showed the overall result of the production test. Red line showed the gas production rate, and blue line showed the water production for about six days. And as you may see, that we achieved a fairly stable production for six days. Green line shows the pressure at ESP pump intake. As a result, we were in production for six days. Cumulative gas production was 120,000 cubic meter and the average daily gas production was 20,000 cubic meter. This is the last slide. This slide shows a process toward the commercialization of mesonhydrate in the latest basic plan on ocean policy approved by cabinet, Japanese cabinet in April 2013. This plan is basically extended the current mesonhydrate R&D program and additionally states that by 2027, a project led by private companies may start. From 2013 to 2015, where we are now, we conducted the first onshore production test here. Oh, sorry, first offshore production test here. And analyzing the test result and overcoming techno technological issues as a preparation for the next offshore production test. This plan also states that we are supposed to conduct a middle to long term production test onshore. Yeah, it's said. We are now searching for the opportunities to conduct such onshore production tests, and I think that Alaska may be one of the options to realize this specific goal. From 2016 to 2018, we are also supposed to conduct the next onshore offshore production test. Uh, for your information, in this plan, research on seabed type, we are targeting at the sand formation type, but the seabed type is also included in this uh, plan at the first time. <coughs> we believe that we need to conduct the next production test mainly for the purpose of verifying our countermeasures against the technological issues, such as sand production, which terminate 
did our first production test last year. Thank you very much for your attention. I welcome your questions. Great. Thank you very much, um, uh, both of you. Uh, that are actually, it was a wonderful sort of division of labor. Uh, you know, the first Ray uh, illustrated how more of a scientific side of the, the methane hydrates, and then of course, uh, Kamoto san did a more of a technology side of the, the story. And if I may, I'd like to uh, start asking some questions. Um, and uh, <laughs> So this will really uh, display my ignorance on all these technology issues. But the the if so, Ray, one of your slides uh, does talk about. Um, I mean, the, you did talk about how you know there obviously you know we need to uh, differentiate the techno, techno, technical recoverable resources and of course the economically rec recoverable resource. Uh, uh, not necessarily, I'm sorry, resource, but uh, et cetera. So it depends, uh, the, the economics of it obviously is impacted by production technology, right? So far, is it, did I get it right that uh, the, the, so far, I guess, uh, what we or maybe the, the uh, so the US is targeting is the sandwich and that also uses the proven production concepts. Uh, is it how you, did I, so that, so that means very much sort of conventional Oil gas. Yes, right. Yeah. That's okay. Right. So that's okay. But so uh, there's no there's there's no conception here of mining it, dredging it, right. this sort of thing. It's it's the type of accumulations that can be produced by drilling wells right. with standard existing equipment. Okay. So once then what, so that's very much that's applicable to the sound ridge, and that's why we're yes. focusing. That's sort of the one of the lower hanging. I mean, well, if there, first, is, yeah, if there is, exactly. But so once we start going beyond that, then what are some of the, the, the production concepts that you need to start considering? I'd like to crack this nut first. Okay, <laughs> all, right. all right. So maybe in five to 10 years, we can have another, another session. Okay. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to ask you, right, is that uh, uh, the, the map shows that there are a lot of uh, potentials around the world, and if I'm not mistaken, the U.S. government has engaged uh, uh, several countries uh, besides Japan, uh, and also, you know, probably besides Canada. I, I guess there are some uh, efforts or experiments with the Indian government and some of the, the, the like China, uh, Korea and such. If you can tell us a little more about where they're at and how, you know, are the U.S. Uh, 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 expertise, you know, is bringing to the table vis-a-vis, uh, um, -vis, you know, where they're at. Uh, and also you can probably tell us about how, you know, our efforts complement what the Japanese are doing as well. That would be great. Okay, well, first, um, yeah, the Department of Energy has agreements at the departmental level to promote gas hydrate science with Japan, uh, Korea, and India, and we collaborated quite extensively with many other nations as well, but those are the ones that have large, uh, well-funded exploration programs. Um, we're all indebted very much to the Japanese program, which has, which has certainly been at the forefront of this effort. They were the first to show gas hydrate existed in sand reservoirs in the marine environment, and then as Kamoto san just showed us, they, they made that substantial effort and investment of demonstrating production from the marine environment, and that, those, are, those are certainly major. Um, India, Korea have both launched, Korea has launched two expeditions to assess gas hydrate occurrence. Um, Korea has. India has launched one, is about to, about to do a second. Both of them have the same general plan of getting a, a feel for what exists in their, their, uh, in their waters and to find a site to attempt a production test. Okay. So what, what is really most needed now is a production test that's of sufficient duration to allow modelers and engineers to begin to predict how these things will behave over extended time frames. They will do that with six days of data if six days of data is all you have to give them. But big error bars on the, on the results. So uh, Kamoto san talked about an onshore test of mid or to long term duration and we think that means 12 months or a year um, before you really get to separate 
all the noise down there out of how the reservoir is responding. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, just a, uh, is it a more follow-up question? Do you have a more or, or, or I have a question about what we've learned from the six days of production, <clears throat> which seems to me very important to this discussion. May I ask it? Sure. Okay. I am interested, Mr. Kawamoto, in the gas-water ratios you encountered, if you can draw a conclusion, and I'm interested, Mr. Boswell, in the theoretical gas-water ratios that you would get in producing this kind of sandstone reservoir. That's one. Number two, I'm curious whether you have yet tested the water part to see whether from an environmental point of view, say Japanese environmental ocean protection rules, you could discharge the water directly into the ocean or you'd have to treat it. But why don't you start with the first, just the physical, I mean, you've got a ratio of methane to water in the hydrate in the pore space. And then you produce it by pressure drop, which sounds to me analogous to what we do with coal, seam, methane, and whatnot, but what kind of ratios do you run, and do you expect the ratios to change as you go along? So regarding that uh, gas-water ratio, as I was showing you the, uh, by graph, as you may see that uh, gas production is, as I explained, like uh, 20,000 cubic meters per day. And uh, water, as you may see that uh, well, oh, this is water production, so around the 200 uh, cubic meters per day. So that means that the 1 to 100 is... 1 to 200? No, 1 to 100. Just 1 to 100? 1 to 100. Cubic meters? Yes, that ra ra ratio is like yeah. that in terms of cubic meters. And uh, we haven't uh, kind of quite... Uh, well, well, understand yet, but in the in theory, that uh, sort of ratio has to be kind of uh, how should I say smaller? I mean, uh, more water projects has has to be there. So I we don't know something in that. So that uh, we are now analyzing the why we got that uh, this uh, water gas production ratio right now. That's what we are doing right you now. You expected more water? Yeah. So it's possible that the water is staying down in the reservoir. Yeah, that's one, one of the, yeah. And then yeah. from a petroleum <laughs> yeah. engineering point of view, that's not very, that may not be very encouraging because it might block the flow of, of methane along the way. Right, yeah. yes. I mean, but there's work yeah, to be yeah. done. Okay. And uh, the next question that uh, regarding that uh, water kind of sort of a quality of the water, produced water, actually we can discharge part of that uh, water into the, dumped into the seawater. We, we just uh, received a sort of a certificate from the, uh, our government well, organization and then that, that passed that uh, well, test. So we discharged that. Thank you very much. Speaking on the, on the environmental uh, sort of a, uh, 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 implications or the category implications, I wanted to ask if uh, there's already sort of discussion uh, that's happening uh, either, you know, within the scientific community that looks at methane hydrate production or maybe with uh, some of the, uh, um, I mean, in general, the, the, the what are, what's the potential uh, the methane leakage uh, challenge associated with uh, uh, sort of a robust production down the road. Uh, it's in in um, in, in you know I, it's a, I don't know if that's more of a policy question, but for now I'm I'm interested you know if there is some sort of a modeling or you know and would it be different from many other ways that methane could uh, be released into the atmosphere. I don't mind taking a shot. Let me take a shot at this. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, methane hydrate, as I, as I mentioned, its abundance in nature has led to a lot of study and one of one of the one of the issues is is it a potential respondent to climate change and there certainly is a potential for that um, those hydrates are the ones that are 
more closely coupled to the environment. They're the ones that exist very near the surface or at the shallow up dip end of the stability zone. Whereas the ones that are the most promising for production are the ones that are most decoupled from the environment, more deeply buried. The more deeply buried they are, the warmer they are, the more competent what they're sitting in is, and the more separation you have from the seafloor. So there isn't a real good connection between those two types of hydrates. They're very different hydrates responding to very different things. You can't disarm a methane release by producing it, and you can't exacerbate a methane release by producing it. They're just two entirely different things. Uh, another issue is people think because hydrate needs to be destabilized that it's somehow unstable. And that just basically, so those pictures you saw that I took, that's hydrate just sort of sitting there. It's way out of its stability zone. It's, you need to be minus 80 C for hydrate to be stable at the surface. Um, and it's just slowly melting like an ice cube taken out of your freezer and put on the table. They, they don't explode when they, they are thermodynamically unstable, which means they can't persist in that state in that condition, but it's not a catastrophic sort of transformation. Um, hydrate wells will be very shallow and they're low pressure by nature. Um, and they have to be pushed out of their stability zone to produce. And if you stop pushing on them, they respond back. Blowouts, yeah. uncontrolled, runaway dissociation is something we can't figure out how it's possible. Am I okay yeah. saying that? Yes, that's fine. <coughs> and, uh, well, <coughs> thank you, Ray. But uh, when we conduct this uh, production test, that uh, we also have a concern on that this environment. So we put uh, a couple of monitoring systems there. One is a methane leakage detector, and the other one is that uh, to detect the subsidence of that uh, sea floor. We cannot, uh, I cannot say anything on that, but uh, since we have a really concern on that environment, we try to sort of uh, well, collect uh, lots of data from a production test. It's a very in short uh, period of time, but uh, we really got uh, quite uh, good data, I, we believe. So we can uh, like explain that the later days. And uh, regarding that the blowouts, even though we put the BOP here, but uh, this is just, uh, we, we have to follow the Japanese industry law. So that's why we put the uh, BOPs. But, uh, there are lots of sort of uh, discussion there, but uh, well, in some way we need we have we may have to have a uh, BOPs because we may have a kind of unexpected gas kick or something like that. So uh, naturally, as they explained, that uh, that is quite a stable thing. So uh, even though it's if it's collapsed by accident, then uh, well the dissociation or the dissolution will naturally stop when you. Well, when you have a water coming into the well. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I don't want to suggest that there are no issues. There are certainly a lot of issues. This is not very well known. It's only been tested a little bit. Um, it is shallow. The, it is producing from something that once you take the hydrate out is unconsolidated. So there are issues with things such as seafloor subsidence from long-term production. And these are all things that have to be yeah. monitored and measured, and then engineering solutions either developed or it won't work. <coughs> Thank you. On this slide that Mr. Yeah. Anything you want. Hi, yeah. right. Jeff Epping with Energy LLC. Um, Two-part question. Uh, given the aspect ratio of these things, do you think? Jeff Epping with Energis LLC. Given the aspect ratio of these reservoirs, do you think ultimately they'll be amenable to horizontal drilling for exploitation? And then, uh, Ray, in your economics, what price did you use for discriminating economic from technically recoverable? <laughs> <laughs> or uh, just some in indicative economics. How, how, how difficult is it economically to exploit these things? 
my standard answer to that is to assess economics, you need to know two things. You need to know what the production profile is going to be over a period of time, and you need to know how much you have to invest to get that production profile. We don't know either one of those things well enough to make an estimate. So I think the answer to your question is that there, it's assumed the technical recoverable is what could be produced, but we don't have a bar with which to slice from that what's economic at present. My, my answer to your question is that uh, <coughs> we don't know yet about the uh, nature of the methanhydrate yet through this uh, short term period of time. So we definitely have to kind of conduct a longer term production test. But as I, as I explained to you that uh, we also have a technological issues like uh, sand production. So we have to stop those sand production first and then uh, we have to continue to uh, dissociate or pro continue to produce longer time. Otherwise we cannot assess the sort of uh, nature of the methanhydrate occurrence. So uh, it's too early to say that the sort of uh, economics or those kind of things. But uh, of course, the Japanese government is push, pushing us that uh, you have to uh, <laughs> raise the numbers as soon as possible. But uh, we still don't have uh, enough uh, information to do that. By the way, I forgot to share our ground rule with the, uh, this audience. Sorry. Uh, uh, when you ask a question, please uh, tell us who you are and, and who you're with, and then wait for the microphone uh, so that the, you know, everyone can hear you, what you need to ask. So, yeah, sure. Uh, Roger Cooper, Cleveland Park Policy Consulting and formerly American Gas Association. Um, thank you for both your work in this area. I've been a big fan of methane hydrates for many years, and I think we're all sitting here going, okay, is this shale gas 15 years ago uh, ready for a technological breakthrough? Um, based on just the six days of, of testing, and obviously it's too early to talk about the decline rates, but maybe as a follow-up also on the horizontal drilling, how do, you, how do you, in an existing well, would you continue to go out horizontally with a depressurization? Technique is that the thinking of how you continue to produce in that area? Well, uh, the, of course, we have to. Maybe we has we may have to consider the sort of a kind of like a extended uh, well production kind of methods. But at this moment, we have to evaluate the sort of a depressurization method itself with the vertical sort of well is the important things. So uh, of course, we kind of had the experience that we drilled the horizontal well in the mesonhydrate layers. We can do that. But uh, even though that uh, since this is sort of a depreciation method, so that uh, the way how we can kind of extend the area is kind of more important than the sort of uh, horizontal wells. So prop maybe cracking or the, like, um, these things may be workable, but uh, we're still in discussion on those sort of uh, next stage. So, but uh, we, we believe that we may have to have some sort of, sort of additional sort of uh, measure to dissociate the mesonhydrate more. Just as a quick follow-up, does that mean that thermal stimulation is not off the table entirely? That may also be used with the depressurization? Probably, yeah, maybe. I'm David Bardeen. I'm retired. I served in the Department of Energy during President Carter's administration. I want to ask him about the slide we have there. The green area, as I understand it, is a sandstone, right. and it's a porous sandstone. And then we have 270 meters above that. Do your core samples or other evidence indicate that there's any kind of sealing layer above that sandstone, or is it not going to? Well, that's that's my concern. Yeah. Okay. That uh, <coughs> good question. That uh, I explained that uh, when we choose this uh, sort of uh, 
place as a testing site. We sort of identify the sort of a, like uh, like clay layers above the, this uh, concentrated zone. So that can be work at the uh, seal for the depression. That's why we select that. Because, because going to Mr. N Ms. Nakona's question, if you have a good seal there, it seems to me there'd be no difference in the risk of leakage between this and conventional natural gas. I mean, if you don't han handle your well right, it could leak. If you handle it right, you're going to get everything for your commercial mm -hmm. production. Of course, if you have areas where the sandstone doesn't have a seal over it, that could be a different story. But I, we're taking it one experiment at a time. <laughs> and, you, and, and I think it's pretty exciting what you've done so far. And we'll but as uh, Lei said, that uh, since this is quite shallow formation, so that uh, these uh, well layers are not consolidated enough. I mean, uh, unconsolidated uh, structures. So uh, there may be cha change in uh, these so, yeah, structures as could well. Can you explain how the monitoring well to the two the, the monitoring wells worked? <laughs> what, where did you where, what were you metering as, as far as gas flow? And where? Actually, we put uh, sort of a, a temporary temperature gauge yeah. in these uh, wells. To see if there was a temperature change. Yeah, and then, uh, so just to detect the temperature here. <coughs> so it's a, it shows a quite uh, sort of a stable temperatures. Over six oh, days? No, 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 no. But in the six days, it kind of changed a lot. Yeah. So we actually get a quite, uh, well, interesting data. Wait, when a hydrate dissociates, it sucks up heat, and it makes the sediment substantially colder. That's how you actually find where hydrate was in cores when you retrieve them in an expedition. You run an IR camera and look for cold spots, and how cold it is is a proxy for how much hydrate was there. So he, they were looking for evidence that hydrate around the monitoring wells had dissociated by the temperature change. And you didn't find any evidence of that? Oh, no, they didn't. But that was only, again, that was only six days worth? Yes. Okay. Paul Connors, Canadian Embassy. Thank you both for your presentations. Uh, uh, Ray, for you. I mean, we do this research and we like to develop it due to eventual commercialization. So where we're at with natural gas uh, and in, after the shale revolution, I'm just wondering what the motivation is for the U.S. government. Uh, to keep researching this, one understands that importing countries with coastlines would be extremely interested in developing this technology. But if, if you accept countries like Canada and the U.S. because of shale now have centuries worth, and we have the climate change challenge, I'm just wondering going forward, uh, does the DOE appetite to keep researching this remain the same, or does it? Well, wane, I, can't, or? I can't speak for the DOE appetite. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, my job is to implement the programs and okay. give it as scientific a vetting as possible of something that looks like it's a future energy option. And I, I think everybody knows that the more options you have and the more well fed they are, the more well served everybody is. Just to jump in a little bit, it's sort of interesting that you know, I've heard some folks um, in the, the, the North American energy sector mention that uh, you know, they actually thought that a next sort of breakthrough would have been not the shale, but methane hydrate, if this were, you know, if we're talking about it, if we're, you know, say 10 years earlier. So in a way, sort of putting basket, bas you know, eggs in a couple of different baskets. But I, I think your question is an excellent one. I mean, you know, the, you know, the U.S. now has a very different energy profile. And uh, so, um, you know, the whole range of say, fossil energy-related R&D efforts uh, that we could be undertaking. You know, it's, I'm always sort of curious as to, you know, where this may keep moving. Of course, you know, that has a lot to do with how it gets funded or continues to be, uh, I suppose. But that's certainly, be, it's a lot more of a political or, or, or you know, policy issues uh, for this particular panel. But maybe, you know, uh, one of these days we can have uh, uh, folks uh, from the policy-making world to come here and then talk about some of these issues. Not, not so. a fair question for Ray. I no, no, no but, but it was a great question. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? 
Hi. Um, Robert Thomas, an independent journalist, Natural Resources News Service. Um, I'm interested in probing what you said about the production profile as best you can. Is any indication that it would be similar to shale or unconventional in which a high percentage of the production occurs in the first few years and then tapers off into a long tail? Or if, it had, if you have any indication that it would be a different kind of production it's, profile? It's a very interesting question. The, the first models of hydrate production suggested very long wait time, very low flat profile with peak productions out 20 years, large volumes, but long times. Once some, we got some data back from the field and began to create models that had a lot of fidelity to the actual variability that exists in the real world, they all changed. We started getting very short wait times in the models. They didn't have to wait any time for the gas to come up in their test, right? <clears throat> Um, potentially high rates early and then production profiles that are short. And that's because the production is all a function of the surface area of your dissociation front. If you have a simple model, you've got just a cylindrical dissociation front. And if you have a complex model, it becomes this highly corrugated thing. So the most recent models suggest its production profiles could be similar to what is seen in a lot of reservoirs and not abnormally long and flat as was originally thought. And much shorter, the earlier sort of the, the Right, well, the, what was originally the, thought was, was scaringly long. Right, right, right. You know, this will never work. No one's going to wait 10 years for the first gap, <laughs> that sort of right, thing. Right. <clears throat> we don't think that's the case anymore. And all the tests have shown that it seems to respond immediately. Before... Per before production begins in your sandstone model, roughly how much of the pore space is water filled and how much is methane filled? When you said 50% of the pore space might be hydrate, I think that's what you said. Um, um, what, in, does, what does that mean in terms of uh, in place methane the, and water and what's, what's the rest of the pore space? The rest is water. Just plain water? Non-hydrate water? Yes. Okay, so of the hydrate, how much is water by mass or by but whatever measure? I'm trying to get my hand and my head around this. It's how mainly much? water. It's not mainly methane, right? Yes. Yes. So, what's the number? Eighty-three percent. Do you know the number? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, it's uh, varied from the well field by field, but uh, like uh, seventy percent. Right. Saturation or something like that? We've seen up to 80% yeah. saturation. The, uh, the rest of the water is, maybe half of it is free water, which is the water that can respond to a pressure. The other half of the water is mm -hmm. bound to clays. Within the hydrate, the hydrate is, I should know this, this is why I'm embarrassed, I, but I, it's 80-ish percent water. <clears throat> so that's very high water compared to conventional natural gas Production. I mean, I'd have to compare it with sort of geopressurized methane, where the methane is dissolved in water, mm -hmm. to get into that kind of ratios. Interesting. Entirely different question. <laughs> what are the next two? Pro I just yeah. say arbitrarily two production experiments yeah. that around the world that you think all of us should be watching for additional, meaning, hopefully meaningful, interesting, fascinating results. Can you point to two? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, you know, as, as Kyle Motosan mentioned, he, you know, Alaska is, is a very good place to conduct the needed test, the longer duration test. Um, we have been working with the operators up there who have the infrastructure uh, to conduct such a test, and they have recently become less willing to enable scientific experiments to be conducted within their money-making arena. <clears throat> um, so we've recently formed a, an agreement with the state of Alaska to sit and they have set aside uh, 12 blocks adjacent to the production areas. Um, 11, I guess. Hmm? 11. Hmm? 11 blocks. Not 12. 12? 
11. You live. Yeah, it's 11. Right. <laughs> 11. Um, <clears throat> for such time for uh, us to work together to see whether they are suitable for production test. And that's one of the things we're working on right now. Uh, but this is in an area where there's no infrastructure, so there's no well, so there's a lot more geologic risk and uncertainty about exactly where you might put a, a test. So. Um, so that is the thing we're working on now. And then Jod Mick, I believe, Kamo to mention. The other one is, as I explained, that we, we are supposed to conduct a offshore production test in uh, 2016 to 2018. We are now started to pr preparing for that. As far as you know, that's really going to happen. You, that, that's, that's a commitment by the, the company in Japan to do it, right? At least you hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> this is, well, this is a sort of a plan of many, I mean, the government, Japanese government. So, and Jogmek is sort of, um, well, that uh, we are promoting this program on behalf of them. So uh, probably we, we got to do that in the near future. So in four years or less, we might know a lot more. Yes, I hope so. And well, the, the combining with the uh, long-term uh, onshore production tests as well. So stay tuned. Um, I think it's uh, it's about time. So thank you, uh, Ray Boswell and Ta Takami uh, Kawamoto, uh, but the leading experts on methane hydrate uh, science and technology. We're very honored that you could join us today. And please join me in thanking the, the two experts. <laughs>